Testing. 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 Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. Testing. Testing. One, two, three. Testing. 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 Hello, hello. All right. Um, so I tell you what, why don't we begin? Um, so I have to do a sound check. Now, somebody who has listened to online said that last week it wasn't um, loud enough. So want to make sure this week it's loud enough. So can you guys hear me OK? Because I wouldn't want anybody to fall asleep. Um, so let's see, a couple things. Um, one is um, uh, today is a feast day of the visitation, as you guys kind of know. But it also, um, it's a couple birthdays today, Deacon Chris's birthday. And, no, who cares about that? But, <clears throat> and it's Tamarack's birthday. Tamarack, stand up. So, okay, don't stand up. Well, don't applaud him. His mother did all the work. I mean, <laughs> anyhow, happy birthday. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So, continuing our class on apologetics. So, there's so much to apologetics. So, this was just an intro, and then, as long as I'm pastor here, every couple... Well, every year we'll have a couple classes on apologetics, just on different subjects. So this was just an intro. So we went through, you know, science versus religion, evidence for God. And this last one is just going to be apologetics about the faith, um, Catholicism. How do you answer things? So I asked people to give me questions. I received three questions, so I'm just going to answer those. But... In all honesty, if you're ever talking to somebody and they say, well, you Catholics, X, Y, Z, um, and you don't know how to answer it, write it down, um, and then during, I'll just save it, then in one of these classes, I'll give the answer back. Does that make sense? Um, so um, the first question that somebody asked was about Sola Scriptura. Uh, and Sola Scriptura, that's not how they asked it, but... Sola Scriptura means scripture alone. So is this too loud? Okay. When, uh, so it's a strange thing that um, uh, that's a question. Sola Scriptura is it has to be written in the Bible. Does it have to be written in the Bible for you to follow it? That's a question. So um, I was meeting with this couple who were planning on getting married, but they were living together, but really nice couple. Um, and she was Catholic, and he was very religious. I, will, I really like him. Very religious, um, but a fundamentalist. And so he had a bunch of questions. Like, he had probably 20 questions of problems he had with Catholicism. Um, and it was kind of funny, because uh, he asked his first question. He says, well, why do you Catholics X, Y, Z? You know, you ask me a question, I can give you a, a half an hour lecture. So, like, I am poised to give him a detailed lecture. And I said, oh, that's in, and I point out in Scripture where it says that. And he's shocked, and he says, oh, okay. But here's a really odd part. Um, I was struck with his absolute sincerity, because he really did want to know. And he aggressively wanted to know, because he was told, Catholics made this up, this is nowhere in the Bible, so I simply point out where in the Bible it says it. And he's, I, I'm struck with his absolute sincerity, but also how quickly, because I'm, I'm expecting like a half an hour argument. 
And he was like, oh, okay. And on to the next question. But really struck me how if it's in the Bible, he's good with it. Does that make any sense? Like, that's a really quick conversion. So, because uh, I still had, you know, 29 minutes of arguments to go. Um, but then, in all honesty, I mean, I know I'm kind of, um, most of it was about worship or why do you, why are priests called father and da 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 da. Um, and when it came to worship questions, I'd say, well, like, shouldn't we worship the way God tells us to worship? And in the Bible, huge sections are written on how to worship. Uh, not just have a rock and roll. Shouldn't we organize the church the way it says so in the Bible? So each time, to be honest, I could win. But I was really struck with um, all he really knew is these series of anti-Catholic teachings that his minister told him. Um, that he says, that's not in the Bible. And then he's shocked to find out it's in the Bible. And for him, in his mindset, if it's in the Bible, he must do it. That's not a bad mindset, but it, he kind of picks and chooses because he's living with his girlfriend. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if you know that it, the Bible does say something about sex. <laughs> Apparently he missed that one. Um, so... It, I also noticed he wasn't really that concerned with what the Bible said. He was more concerned about the interpretation of the Bible that he was told. So he really could apply the Bible when it came to anti-Catholic things, but he couldn't apply the Bible to other parts of religion. So when I say sola scriptura, it's this belief that, well, it has to be in the Bible, uh, that the Bible is the sole authority in religion. The irony about that is, um, um, like, here's the really odd part. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. In fact, I'll get into this. The Bible actually teaches the opposite. Anytime somebody says it has to be written in the Bible, where in the Bible does it say it has to be in the Bible? It, like, even the word Bible is not in the Bible. So, Catholics agree with evangelicals that scripture is a standard of truth, even a preeminent one, but not in the sense that it rules out other sources of authority, such as tradition or the church or the Holy Spirit. The Bible itself teaches that there's other authorities besides the Bible that you must listen to. Not, so no biblical passage ever teaches that scripture is the only authority. Um, as I said, the Bible teaches the complete opposite. Neither the Old Testament uh, Jews or the early church were ever guided by this idea of sola scriptura. Um, it's a completely modern view, but here's the odd part. Anybody who's a biblical scholar would realize it's crazy. Um, because uh, it doesn't even say it in the Bible. Um, and just speaking of the Bible, you get this thing of, um, wait, because this, I really did like him. He actually ended up converting. But um, the guy that the, of the couple said, well, you Catholics don't follow the Bible. And I said, but we're the ones who wrote it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, so my joke is, your Bible is based on my church. Um, <laughs> Because he says, well, no, it's just Christians who wrote. Well, who the heck, and tell Martin Luther, who, who do you think wrote the Bible, the Presbyterians? All there was was Catholicism. So when somebody says um, Catholics don't believe in the Bible, you know, my reply is, we wrote the New Testament. Um, you know, there was no such thing as non-denominational Christians until the 19th century. And besides, which came first? The Bible or the church? The church. Um, when Acts of the Apostles describes the early church, it says it devoted themselves to three things. The breaking of the bread, that's early term for the Eucharist, the teachings of the apostles, and the hours. The hours are, it's a Jewish, if you're a Jew, you know. It means daily prayer. Every, throughout the day, you, you stop and say prayers. 
But notice it said the teachings of the apostles. The teachings of the apostles, it, um, they, it didn't say they devoted themselves to the reading of the Bible. Why didn't it say that? Because the Bible isn't written yet. I know that sounds kind of strange, but the Bible, the church came first, then later the church wrote the Bible. So the church was born on Pentecost, which we're celebrating this weekend. And I love that, where St. Peter gives this great homily, and 3,000 people at the end of the homily uh, asked to be baptized. That is one hell of a good homily, if you can get 3,000 <laughs> conversions. Um, but, so, um, the birth of the church is on Pentecost. And in Paul's letters uh, to the Colossians, he says, the body of Christ is the church. So, after Pentecost, uh, it mentions that Paul started persecuting the church. So Paul starts to church, persecute the church. So think about this. The church existed before St. Paul. But here's my question. Which part of the Bible was written first in the New Testament? What part of the Bible was written first? Anybody know? Not John. Not the Gospels. Yes, Paul. Letter to the Thessalonians is the o oldest part of the Bible. So think about this. Paul per starts persecuting the church, but the first to actually write something down is St. Paul. So that's several years. Then later, um, the Gospel of Mark. So which came first, the Bible or the church? You would say the church. So when non-denominational denomination says that all you need is the Bible, um, that's not at all what the Bible says. Um, you need to belong to the church. Um, so St. Paul, we're going back to Pentecost, when St. Peter gives a homily, like they say, well, what must we do to be saved? He does not say, just accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Doesn't say that, that's nowhere in the Bible. What does he say? Be baptized, repent and be baptized. He doesn't say, just read the Bible. It's not written yet. Um, so, like, this sounds kind of strange. If you're going to read the Bible, you should know the author, which is God inspired it, but the author is the church. So when it comes to authority, when Christ ascends um, to heaven, my joke is, as Christ is ascending, he didn't say to the apostles, read my book! Um, <laughs> buy the book. Uh, he doesn't say, just follow the book. Um, Christ does say that all authority has been given to him, and then he commissions the apostles to go out and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, and teach them to observe everything that I taught you. He didn't say, just give them a book and let them start their own churches. There's supposed to be one church, and we're supposed to teach it. The Bible's not going to be written until later. Um, so, Jesus does command to teach, but the first teachings are oral teachings. That means tradition. Um, Christ commanded them to be part of one church, not just start your own church based on your interpretation. So, when somebody says Catholics don't follow the Bible, well, who told you that the Bible was holy? If you believe the Bible is sacred, who told you that that Bible was holy? Was that God? Or, no, it was the Catholic Church. The Bible is a profession of faith in the Catholic Church. We're the ones who wrote it. It just didn't drop out of the sky. It wasn't written by independent Christians. And what happened is bishops gathered together in the very early church saying, well, what parts, of, what, what parts are holy? And, yeah, they pick out the letters of Paul, the revelations, um, uh, well, letters, and for the Gospels. There is a lot more other writings that they could have picked from that are just as old as the Gospels. A lot of people forget that. Yes, you have the New Testament, but we have a lot of letters and writings from the early church that are just as, the Didache, that's just as old as the Gospels. They picked which parts are holy based on what was being read at Mass. So it's the liturgy that was the litmus test of whether it should belong to the Bible or not. Um, so you have this 
synod in Hippo, um, then in Carthage. So um, it's, a, it's a Catholic church that both wrote and decided what parts would be in the Bible. So here's the words from this Professor Slint, sorry, Flint, who's this non-Catholic scholar um, who translated like the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, won this famous prize in Washington Biblical Archaeological Society. But he said, without the Catholic Church, you would have no Bible, just a bunch of books and letters. With the Catholic Church, you have the Bible. So, like, I just want to point him out, because it's just not us saying that. Anyone who's an archaeological slash scripture scholar would know this. Um, or what books belong to the Bible. The Bible itself doesn't say what parts of the book belong in the Bible. That's a Catholic Church. And we picked it based on scripture. Um, and so my point being is that, wow, the author, inspired by God, but the author was a, holy, it was a church who wrote it down. So if I said, if you believe in Sola Scriptura, that it's got to be in the Bible, then here's my question. What is the bulwark and the pillar of truth? What, is, what does the Bible say is the bulwark and the pillar of truth? Yeah, the church. Not the Bible. It's the church. Um, so no offense, the guy who's saying it's got to be in the Bible, he acts as if, as if the Bible is the only pillar of church. Just, sorry, the only pillar of truth. But the Bible itself says that's the church. In 1 Timothy says, what is the pillar of truth? It's the church. And what does a pillar do? It holds something up. That's what the church does. What does a bulwark do? It protects something. It's the church that protects the truth. Not a book, the church. So, no offense, the, the evangelical guy, he wants to convince people that there's one authority, and there's only one authority, and it's the Bible. Really, it's not. It's his interpretation of the Bible. But the Bible itself says, no, the pillar of truth is the church. Um, now, granted, um, the Bible itself teaches us that church came before the Bible. But think about this. It's not like Jesus wrote down anything. The only thing he wrote down was when he wrote in the dirt, and that's the sins of the people trying to stone the adulterous woman. So Jesus chose not to write anything, but instead to build a church. And then 30 to 60 years later after his resurrection, he inspires a church to write down the stories. Uh, or you hear this thing, oh, well, Catholics, um, Catholics aren't allowed to read the Bible. Um, I can't tell you how crazy that is. Now, granted, there was problems with people misinterpreting the Bible, so that was a problem. But why do you think we invented stained glass windows? Because peasants were illiterate. So we illustrated it with windows and depicted on statues and um, icons. It's a way of telling the story. Um, so Jesus left a church, not a book. Um, and this sounds kind of strange, but I want to... The word of God is not necessarily the same thing as the Bible. I know that sounds kind of strange. Um, that Catholics and evangelicals totally agree that the Bible is the word of God. But the word of God is larger than just a book. Because scripture says, and the word became flesh. It doesn't say that the word became paper. Jesus, God becomes flesh. Uh, and then institutes a church and gives them the New Testament. Evangelicals want to believe that the word of God only comes about in a written form. But the Bible says the very opposite, that the word of God can come in tradition. So what it says, actually, um, in the Old Testament, it says God gave Moses Torah. The word Torah means teaching. It did not say God gave Moses the Torah. The Torah is you know, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, Torah itself means law. And so ancient Jews saw that God gave Moses an oral tradition as well as a written tradition. Historically, the oral tradition always precedes the written tradition. That's pretty obvious. 
But the word of God is both the oral tradition and the written word. So the word word in scripture um, often, more often, means an oral proclamation of the apostles, not just writings. So the prophets spoke the word of God, but it may not have been written down for quite some time before that. Or look at Jeremiah. For 23 years, the word of God came to me, and I spoke it to you again and again. But you did not listen to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, the Lord Almighty says, because you have not listened to my words. So think about that. Nowhere does it say Jeremiah wrote it. He proclaimed it for 23 years. So the word of God is in tradition, um, not just written down. And we'd say, oh, that tradition is an authority you have to listen to. So um, uh, anyhow, uh, you'll say over and over, the word of God came to this person. The word of God came to this person. It wasn't a book. Or St. Paul says, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the words of men, but the word of God. Um, so St. Paul, the word of God, first came in an unwritten form. Um, but And St. Paul himself regards tradition as equal to scripture. So he says, keep away from any brother who lives in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. So the word of God is not only uh, written on a piece of paper, but the word of God is in tradition. Um, and Jesus and St. Paul says, accept the oral tradition and the written tradition. So St. Paul and Jesus um, accepted the uh, authority of the Old Testament, but even their traditions. So the Old Testament appeals to other authorities outside the written scriptures. Um, quick example, there's a reference. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now that's in Matthew, right? Where it says, he shall be called a Ma Nazarene. But here's the prob problem. Is that phrase, he shall be called a Nazarene, you can't find that in the Old Testament. That was part of Jewish tradition. It's not part of the Bible. Or in Matthew 23, Jesus teaches that the scribes and the Pharisees have uh, the power to bind and loose based on, quote-unquote, Moses' seat. That phrase, Moses' seat, the chair of Moses, um, you can't find that anywhere in the Old Testament. That's part of the tradition, the liturgical tradition of Jews, where in every synagogue there was a chair, and they called it the chair of Moses that you would teach from. That's not in Scripture, but Jesus mentions it. That's part of Jewish tradition. Or uh, this confounding Jewish tradition, it's mentioned in the, um, the Mishnah, which teaches there's a sort of teaching succession from Moses down on. Um, Jesus mentions that. Or in 1 Corinthians, Paul refers to this rock that quote-unquote followed the Jews in the Sinai wilderness, Jesus mentions that, or sorry, Paul mentions this rock that followed the Jews. But where do you find that in the Old Testament? You don't. It's part of tradition. Or um, Paul says, Janus and Jambres oppose Moses. If you look in the Old Testament, you can't find these two names. Where did St. Paul learn this? That was part of Jewish tradition that he's quoting. That's in the New Testament. So no, the word of God is not just a book. It's tradition. Or St. Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold fast to the traditions that I handed on to you. He didn't say, you're holding fast to the book I handed on to you. Um, and the point is that the early church considered the word of God both tradition and scripture. Um, Fundamentalists often think the word tradition is an evil word. Um, and so, uh, like, the reason why Martin Luther came up with sola scriptura was as a way of undergirding tradition. But any scripture scholar would know, oh no, the Bible itself teaches both. And 
the Bible itself teaches that tradition is necessary, that the scripture alone argument, um, it's really a way of saying that church is not necessary. Tradition is not necessary. Uh, but the Bible teaches the opposite. In Thessalonians, we're told to hold fast to the traditions that we've received, uh, handed on by word or letter. In Corinthians, St. Paul says, hold fast to the traditions handed on to you. In John, Jesus says he did many things that are too numerous to uh, be written down. Without tradition, how do you know what the written parts mean? Um, so, I already mentioned that in the Old Testament, um, the priest, uh, I don't think I mentioned that, just, so in the Old Testament, um, if you look in the book of Leviticus, which you, people know you love the book of Leviticus, uh, actually I do, um, but it says that, is there an argument on interpretation between two people on what scripture means? If there's an argument between two people, go to the priest and the priest will settle it. Well, um, so clearly you just can't pick up scripture. There's another authority that the Bible says, well, if there's an argument, go to the priest. Uh, that's not tradition, that's magisterium. Um, and so the evangelicals, no offense, like to promote this image that Jesus is only pro-scripture and anti-tradition. But Jesus says to the Pharisees, you cling to human traditions over the commands of God. So the Pharisees, they're making, making up their own traditions. But um, in, for Catholics, there's not a dichotomy between traditions of God or the apostles versus traditions of men. So, sorry, take, take it back. There is a dichotomy. So, like, when Catholics use the word tradition, technically the word tradition means everything that Jesus taught the apostles that will hand on. Everything that Jesus taught the apostles that will hand on to the next generation. But everything that Jesus taught the apostles wasn't in written form, was it? Because the Bible's not going to be written for a couple decades. So tradition for us, it can be oral or written. Um, so that's the traditions, the apostolic traditions. Traditions with a small t, the traditions of man. Traditions of man would be like, oh, you know, in the 17th century, they came up with fiddleback. Does that mean I'm obligated to wear a fiddleback because they came up with something in the 17th century? No, that's a tradition of men. Does that make sense? That's not an apostolic tradition. So there is a difference. Does that make any sense? So when I say tradition, I don't mean just history. I mean everything Jesus taught the apostles. Um, and Jesus himself believes in tradition. At the Passover, Jesus um, is obviously a fan of tradition because in the Exodus, this sounds kind of strange, it doesn't mention the wine. But Jesus at the Last Supper, he celebrates the Passover using wine because that's part of Jewish tradition, uh, how the cup was used. But technically, it doesn't say that in the Bible. Um, you have the St. Uh, Paul line, hold fast to the dish traditions you handed on either orally or written. Um, or how about this one? There's 73 books in the Bible. Where'd you get that? Uh, that was because the church handed on to us. Um, so, uh, like, this sounds kind of strange. Uh, anyhow, it doesn't matter. Um, I was going to get us something, but I won't. Um, so, even the early church, they had this tension of tradition. So, um, uh, you have this tension of tradition, but that's where priests and bishops come in. As I said in the Old Testament, if there is a conflict between interpretation of Scripture, the Bible itself says go to a priest. That's an authority outside Scripture. Um, so, the apostles exercise authority as well. Think about the first council in Jerusalem. That's an Acts. We see Peter and James get into this argument. And the council um, makes this authority a pronouncement, saying this is from the Holy Spirit. St. Peter gets up. He makes the call and says, this is what we're going to do. For it seems good that the Holy Spirit and to us 
to lay no greater burden on you than the necessary things. So in the, the point being is that, wow, that's an authority outside of the Bible. That was the apostles and bishops gathering together in Jerusalem. Or in the next chapter, Paul tells Timothy and uh, uh, Silas that they're traveling around to the cities and, and uh, says that they delivered to them the observance of the decision reached by the apostles and the elders. They didn't say, oh, just follow the Bible. They said, follow the apostles. That gets into a huge fight. Um, does that make any sense? Um, so, um, they say, well, there, no. The Bible itself teaches other authorities. The Holy Spirit, the apostles, tradition. So anytime they say, it's got to be in the Bible, the Bible itself doesn't say that. Now, you'll get these arguments. Uh, I'm going to give you the arguments. So, fundamentalists, will use this proof text of Sola Scriptura saying, oh, 2 Timothy, it says, quote, all scripture is profitable and inspired. Well, yes, we do believe that all scripture is profitable and all scripture is inspired, but it doesn't say that all scripture is sufficient. It doesn't say all you need for the truth is scripture. Um, it says it's profitable and inspired. We believe that. Um, we have scripture at every sacrament. So yes, scripture is necessary. It's just not sufficient. A bat is necessary to play baseball, but it's not all what you need. You also need a couple other things, such as a ball to ba play baseball. And mitt. It doesn't say it's the only thing that's necessary. Or St. Paul writes in 2 Timothy, um, uh, the New Testament, think about it, the Gospels haven't been written. And he writes, um, uh, if you read it, uh, this all scripture is profitable and inspired. Uh, here's the thing about this. What scripture is St. Paul talking about? Because the Gospels haven't been written yet. And he's the one who does the first writing. So what part of the Bible is he referring to? Okay, did you miss that? What I was trying to make? If he says all scripture is inspired, what part of the scriptures is being, has, of the New Testament has been written? Just his letters. <laughs> so he's not talking about his letters because he's writing it to other people. If all scripture is inspired, what part of the Bible is it referring to? The Old Testament. So when they say, well, 2 Timothy, all, by, all you need is a Bible. It says right there in 2 Timothy, all the, the Bible is inspired, and, but it doesn't say sufficient. And what St. Paul is talking about in that letter is not the Gospels. He's talking about the Old Testament. Who, who above you would say, all you need is the Old Testament? No, <laughs> That's crazy talk. Um, anyhow, oh, or you'll get these, because um, I've heard these. You'll get John 20, you know, it says, all these things were written so that you may believe. Well, that's true. Um, all these things were written that you may believe. But um, that doesn't say all you need is the Bible. Uh, if you read the verse just before that, um, it totally defeats that scripture is all you need. Because what it says is, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples that are not written in this book. These are written that you may believe. Well, that just defeats the sola scriptura argument. So if you hear that argument, say, why don't you read the verse before that? Um, uh, anyhow, I've also heard this, that Catholics don't teach biblical doctrine. Have you ever heard that one? That's a sola scriptura one. But then ask the question, where in the Bible does it define what is a biblical doctrine? Because show me. Um, you, know, um, you know, what do you define as a biblical doctrine? Because if you say all I need to follow is the Bible, how many people here have eaten shrimp? How many people here have had, how many people have eaten shrimp? Sinners! Uh, that's an abomination that's in the Bible. 
How many people have here had a cheeseburger? Sinner! How many of people here have had a Chick-fil-A sandwich? Sinner! Because they put mayonnaise on it, and you're not allowed to meet, mix dairy products and a meat product, which the mayonnaise on a chicken... Um, does that make any sense? So what, what do you call a biblical doctrine? Does that make sense? Um, it, it's not even defined in the Bible itself. Um, or, like I got this two weeks ago where this kid wanted to talk to me after Mass Kid in his 20s. And he's Catholic, and he said, you know, all my friends, they go to another church and they say, we're not following biblical doctrine because we're not preaching the rapture. Oh, for the love of Jesus. So, I said, you know, the, in Greek, there is a word that means raptor, like rapacious, a uh, caught. But that doctrine is not in the Bible itself. That's an interpretation of the Bible. It's not in Scripture itself. So I said, you know, have them point out where it is and then note whatever they point out, that's going to be an interpretation. That's not going to be actually what it says. And I said, even rapture. Rapture was first invented by this guy in England, but then this preacher in, um, in the 19th century, uh, like 1950, in Michigan, is the one who promoted the rapture. And then these Tim LeMay Lafay books that totally, totally are scripturally inaccurate, uh, that drives me up the wall, promoted rapture. Like you'll say, the ones left behind, like you, you don't want to be left behind, right? No, actually you do. Um, the ones left behind are the ones that are saved. If you look at Moses' family was quote unquote left behind. So the phrase left behind means left behind from the world meaning you're saved. So, like, everything that they say is like, well, if you're a scripture scholar, the Tim LeMay, LeFay books made him a lot of money, but they're not really, they're an embarrassment. Um, and how do you interpret anything in the Bible just on, like, I know this literal interpretation is so hard. Like, you want to be very careful. You need tradition to interpret something literally. Uh, or sorry, you need tradition to interpret what something says. If you just say, well, I'm just going to literally interpret it, how do you do that? Because I'll give you an example. Um, if I said, I never stole the money, what does that mean? That's only six words, right? I never stole the money. But that can be interpreted different ways. I never stole the money. Um, oh, wait, let me, the phrase should be, I never said you stole the money. So that can be interpreted five ways. I never said you stole the money, or it could be interpreted, I never said you stole the money, or I never said you stole the money. I wrote it down. Um, I never said that you stole money, you just stole jewelry. Uh, you know, like, so like, you need tradition to help interpret. You need others to, so that's why starting the Old Testament, you have priests to help interpret. Look at the New Testament. You have the Ethiopian eunuch uh, going along and he's trying to read the Bible and he doesn't understand these prophecies. So it's Philip who goes jogging along beside him explaining what scripture means. And, you know, the joke is how can you explain scripture unless somebody's there to help uh, interpret it? Like, you need a church to help with interpretation. Um, so, two examples. Ezra, the priest in the Old Testament, he studied Jewish law, taught the people, um, but then even Ezra says you need people to help you interpret the scripture. You just can't pick up it and come up with yourself. Or Nehemiah, in Nehemiah, Ezra reads the law of Moses to the people, and in verse 7, um, 13 Levites are assigned to uh, assist Ezra in helping the people understand what was just proclaimed. Well, there you need other people. So the Bible itself requires teachers just to interpret the text. Um, so you need a community to help interpret it. Um, that's 
my only point being. My problem when people say sola scriptura, it's a way of cutting out the church, tradition, the Holy Spirit, to everything that means I get to interpret the Bible the way I want to. Um, and I know that sounds kind of hard, but think about this. Martin Luther said sola scriptura, right? He said it has to be in the Bible. But then, have you ever wondered why Catholic Bibles are larger than Protestant <laughs> Bibles? Because he cut out parts that he didn't like. Um, he has a whole history of this. Then he added words that he liked, like um, faith alone. Nowhere does it say faith alone. He added the word alone. Or pick up a Protestant Bible, and I'll say at the Lord's Prayer, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. That's a liturgical response. Nowhere in ancient Bibles do you see that. That was a mass response that was later added to Lutheran Bibles. Or um, Luther didn't like that the Magi made it to the manger. So he, Magi are Zorian, Aster, and priests. He didn't like the fact that Persian priests could make it to the manger. So he changed his translation to wise men. <laughs> but it's Magi. So like the joke is, it's not really Sola Scriptura, it's sola individual. That the Bible has to interpret the way I want. Yeah. No, don't worry, I'm off. All right, I'm way off. Seriously. Uh, yes, that's true. Um, there's a whole history there that um, we chose some, but some... Like this, it's still an argument today. I can't remember what some of those books are. Some of those books were used liturgically, but then in Carthage, uh, when they gathered together to decide what books would be in, the Catholic Church said not these, but the Ethiopians kept the books that they didn't. So, yeah, so you're right. The Orthodox have even a bigger Bible, the Ethiopians, but... That is clever, you did know that. <laughs> okay, so that's just Sola Scriptura. Sorry, I went way too long on that. Um, so any questions about Sola Scriptura? To, oh, yeah. Uh, apostolic tradition, so tradition would be... Um, the, 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 the sacraments, the creed, and really even the Gospels themselves, the New Testament. Um, so apostolic tradition would be yeah, um, holy orders, the sacraments, the creed. So, does that make sense? Right, so think about this. If you... If, if you say, oh, it's a, like, people do this all the time. If you want to know what an apostolic tradition is, it has to be from the time of the apostles. So, um, like, you get this all the time where, um, oh, and this is not putting it down. I'm just saying, Father John likes to do this thing where um, he puts a pall over his chalice. So there's six chalices at, at Mass, and he likes to put this white, this, well, it's not white, but this cloth over his chalice, and somebody complained that I wasn't doing it. <laughs> and they said, it's a di tradition. And I said, really? Where does the apostles do that? Over just one chalice, not all the chalices. And they said, well, they don't know. And I said, oh, yeah, I could tell you when that started. <laughs> and it was, you know, the 18th century. That doesn't make it. If it's the 18th century, I don't think the apostles lived that long. D does that make any sense? So that's, that's a tradition of man. I'm not obligated. Yeah, Tamarack.
Are you are you saying because I are you, that there's a lot of different evidence for your faith? The Bible is just one source. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> that is not what you're saying. <laughs> oh. So tighten that up so I can, anybody who's listening can know what you said. Right. Yeah, actually, yeah, it's a leap of faith that those bishops that gathered and said these books are inspired, even if you come up like Luther with different books, it doesn't matter. It's still a leap of faith into the you believe these books are sacred, but those books is a leap of faith into the church because the church is the one who said these books are. Is that what you're saying? And later written down. Yeah. They Traditions took form of a book at that point, right. But not all the traditions are in the form of a book. My problem is that if you take, like, and they're good people, but if you say sola scriptura, it does always evolve to sola individual of how I want to interpret it. But if you have tradition and a magisterium um, and other authorities, Well, that's true. Oh, you don't want to weigh that. <laughs> that guy's crazy. That's true. Just one more. But here's the thing. We would not say all you need is a priest's opinion. I'm allowed to disagree with a priest or a pope um, on certain things. But it is one source, not the only source.
Oh, so you know what though? So let me just go off. This sounds kind of strange. Another uh, authority that the Catholic Church says, is a lot of people don't know this one, uh, we have what's called the supremacy of one's conscience. So, like, that's not in Scripture. That's not in tradition. That's not asking the priest or a pope or a bishop. That is, you know what the Holy Spirit is telling you. And sometimes, this sounds kind of strange, sometimes for you to be faithful, you have to go against the interpretation of Scripture. You may even have to go against the pope. So we have saints that literally um, were excommunicated, but it turns out by going against the magisterium, they did exactly what God wanted. Or people that disagreed with an interpretation of Scripture and ends up being a saint. So that's just another one, is that you still have to, you can't say the Bible told me to do it. Our position with the supremacy of one's conscience is, no, that's just your interpretation of Scripture. Or... You can't say the priest told you to do it. No, because you still have your conscience would have told you that that was correct. Okay. So just 10 minutes left, so I'm going to quickly cover the other one somebody asked, if you don't mind. So I'm not doing the third one. Uh, is purgatory. So, oh, you don't want that one? <laughs> so really quick, what is purgatory? Who knows? Um, just kidding. This sounds kind of strange. I remember um, when I was a seminary and I had this spiritual director named Father Pascal, who I just thought he was great. But anyhow, I told him, I said, I just don't believe in purgatory. I told him the truth. And he says, oh, I do. And then he explained purgatory. And this is the embarrassing part. Once he explained purgatory, I realized, oh, I had the wrong definition in my head what purgatory was. I thought it was a place of punishment between heaven and hell. Uh, and it was like, oh, okay, I guess I had the wrong definition of purgatory. <laughs> um, purgatory, like I, my joke is, I'm just hoping to make it to purgatory. Because <laughs> if you make it into purgatory, you are going into heaven. <laughs> so this sounds kind of strange, but technically there is no place called purgatory. I know that sounds strange. We speak of it as a pla place, just as a mental construct. Um, but technically, uh, once you die, it's either heaven or hell. <laughs> so what is purgatory if it's not a place? Um, so I'll use this analogy, because I love near-death experiences. So you guys know what near-death experiences are, right? So uh, one, I don't know why, I'm just amazed at this one, this guy... He dies, goes through the tunnel, great light, his whole life is folded in front of him. He can feel everything that he caused in front of the light. His whole life he can see beginning and end all at once, but he could feel his life as well. So what he meant by that is he said like once um, him and his wife got in an argument and he hit his wife. He says, I could feel what she felt. I could feel her terror. Uh, and he said, then, I, you know, after the fight, she went to the grocery store just to get away from him, and she was uh, curt to the uh, grocery clerk. And he says, I could feel how the grocery clerk felt, and that was all me. I caused that. Does that make any sense? He says, in front of the light, I could see what I caused, good and bad, I saw how everything I caused. Well, you could, to me, that's a great analogy of purgatory. Because could you imagine, let's say he didn't see that, and he goes into heaven, but he's unaware how, even though he admitted he loved his wife, but he was shocked how he would cause such pain to his wife, even though he loved her. So imagine he's in heaven, and later his wife comes, um, and he's unaware of how he's been cruel to her, it will no longer be heaven for her. <laughs> and the book of Revelation says no unclean thing will enter into heaven. So the early Christians came up with this idea, it's a mental construct, well, there's got to be a purgatory, a place where we're purified from all those things that we couldn't admit in our life. So purgatory 
it's like all these near-death experiences where people feel something. So here's the odd part. Purgatory is not a dogma, it's a doctrine. Remember, dogmas are things you have to believe. Doctrines are things we believe for 2,000 years, but nowhere did Christ demand it. So this is just this ancient concept that was part of the early church. Um, later, this sounds kind of strange, it wasn't in tr- until 1160 that we actually came up with a name for it, purgatory. But we always believe that there is a purification. So before 1160, uh, it was used as a verb. After 1160, it's used as a noun, like a place. But clearly, uh, before that, it was articulated that, ah, when you enter into heaven, God will purify us. So purgatory is just this verb of this final purification before entering into heaven. So purgatory is a process. Now here's the odd part. Really, we had believed purgatory starts here. And now we're trying to get cleaned up. But even if I try the best, you know, and I'm probably the holiest person in this room, um, oh, that's a laughter. Uh, but if I died today, uh, I have a long ways to go. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, even saints go through purgatory. Probably the only one who doesn't go through purgatory is, you know, some child, who, infant that died. Why would they have to go through purgatory? They've committed no wrong. But, so purgatory is the doorway into heaven. It's a place before we enter into heaven. Um, so purgatory is this place of freedom that we're cleansed from everything. Um, uh, like, and it does strike me how, you get this, really good people can be very blind about their own sins. Uh, I could tell stories about that, but I'll skip that. <laughs> um, but it's not really a place of suffering either, and I wish it is. But um, we'd say uh, everybody who's gone th- through a near-death experience, they always say in front of the light they've never felt such love but they also got to feel what pain that they caused other people, and they're cleaned up. So like St. Catherine of Genoa said, uh, she speaks about purgatory, that those in purgatory know more love than we know here, and they're happier in purgatory than we are here. And so, so he says, apart from the happiness of the saints in heaven, I think there is no greater joy compared to those in purgatory. Um, and she says, the obstacle, okay, so the pains of purgatory, Purgatory, she said, are the obstacles that are rust that's being removed. Um, the fire consumes them and our soul expands. As a rust departs, the soul knows more and more happiness. They can never say that these pains are pains so great as their love in the presence of God. Um, so that makes sense to me. It's letting go of our sins and our ignorances that are painful. Um, so, uh, you say, well, where is this in Scripture? Well, where is this idea of purgatory in Scripture? Well, I'm just going to go and take that. Um, let me go, just skip that. First, you have Maccabees. Uh, Maccabees, in Second Maccabees, there's a story of Judas, the commander, uh, the forces of Israel, made sacrifice and prayer offerings for the sins of those who have died. So think about this. It says, They all, therefore, praise the ways of the Lord, the just judge who brings all things to light that are hidden. Turning to supplication, they prayed that the sinful deeds might be blotted out. They took up a collection among his soldiers as he sent it to Jerusalem to be provided for an expiatory sacrifice. So think about this. In 2 Maccabees, those who have died, they believe that you could pray for those and offer sacrifices, that the sins that they committed would be forgiven, even if they're going to go to God. So they had this, I developed this idea of the Jewish prayer of the dead, that you'd wash the body and then pray for the person who had died, um, that they would be in heaven. Well, why would you pray for them if there's not a purgatory? Or Malachi says, 
Lo, the day is coming, blazing like an oven, when all the proud and the evildoers will be stubble. That day will come and set them on fire, and leave neither root nor branch, says the Lord. But for those who fear my name, there will be the sun of justice with its healing rays. So on the day of the Lord, when we die and meet God, yeah, there is a flame that will burn things away, but that flame will also be a healing source. That's a description of purgatory. Or, and I'm not done. Um, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, Whoever says word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in this age or in the one to come. So, yes, Christ can forgive in this age, but he mentions the age to come. When he mentions the age to come, um, assumes that the presence of sins can be forgiven after death. So, otherwise, why would Christ have mentioned it? If you couldn't be forgiven of your sins in the next age, why would Christ have mentioned that? If Christ thought that the forgiveness after death was impossible, then he wouldn't have mentioned it as a possibility. Um, he just wouldn't have brought it up. So since Jesus mentioned that some sins can be forgiven in the next life, um, that's what we'd mean by purgatory. Um, that no, en no unclean thing would enter into heaven. Or St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, and think of pur purgatory when he says this, every man's work will be manifested on the day of the Lord. It will be revealed in fire, and the fire will try every man's deeds of what sort it is. If a man's work remains, which he has built there, thereupon, he will receive reward. If a man's work burns, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as by fire. So St. Paul um, mentions um, this idea of, I'm just going to um, so I'll just read this. Um, uh, St. Paul mentions that some people's wood lives are built on a lot of wood or straw, and parts of your life has some precious metals in it, gold and silver. On the day of the Lord, in front of the presence of God, all the wood and straw will be burned away, and the only thing that will remain is the gold and the silver. Does that make sense? So everything that's useless and transitory will be burned away. That's an image of purgatory. Does that make any sense? The only thing that will remain is the pure. Um, so St. Paul mentions that in Corinthians. In Timothy, um, he mentions the same thing as uh, 2 Maccabees, that May God grant him to find mercy from the Lord on the day of the dust, day of judgment. Well, so in the day of judgment, God can forgive your sins. Um, or First John says that you should pray for those who have committed non-deadly sins. Well, if you can pray for the dead who's committed non-deadly sins, doesn't that mean that there is a purgatory? Or the book of Revelation says no unclean thing will enter into heaven. Our idea is that God will clean it up. Um, God will purify us. And so if you just look at the early church, there's all these references to purgatory. Um, uh, so, this sounds kind of strange. Yeah, we would say, yeah, we believe in purgatory. Now, let's say Gina refuses to believe in purgatory. Is she still Catholic? Yes, because it's a doctrine, not a dogma. But I just think, it, uh, I really think, especially the, St. Paul image of wood and, and straw being burned up and the gold remaining. That's my favorite image of purgatory. Yeah. Um, after death. Because, uh, okay, that's it. Not a, like in the book of Revelation, I do love this image. In the book of Revelation, they hear that the lamb is coming and they don't want to be in front of the lamb. They don't want their deeds exposed to the light. So they go and run and hide in the cave. And they yell, the wrath of the lamb, the wrath of the lamb. 
and they hide in the darkness. So the joke there is that lambs aren't known for being vicious animals. Like the irony is that, wow, they're so attached to their own sins, the darkness, that they will never step in front of the light. Some people don't, will not give up their sins. They will, I mean, really, I hate to say that I've seen this, where, honest to God, like, so many secrets, because no offense, i kind of the keeper of secrets, um, and I meet these people in my pastoral experience who think as long as they can die and nobody finds out the truth that they've won, <laughs> you haven't won. There's purgatory. Everything will come to light. There is no secrets in heaven. All will be exposed. So no, no, I'll give you an example. So like I know a woman who, um, her, one of her children is from her husband's best friend. Now, it's kind of obvious, like I figured it out, like, <laughs> and she is going to, like, it doesn't matter how, like, medical conditions look, she's just hoping to die without anybody finding out. But you're going to have to come to terms with it in purgatory. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Like, uh, so we have some... Yeah, we are always responsible. Well, okay, so for something to be a sin, you have to know that it's a sin. It, there's no way he did not, even if he was mentally ill, well, it's, we don't know that he was mentally ill, but he would have known that that was a sin. Even the mentally ill, like I know, you know, people who are mentally ill still have a moral compass. They might not know something. Uh, one particular thing is a sin. Well, yeah, I think that's no. I don't think it's evil possession, but I don't like I I don't know. But think about this: he was bullied. So he was bullied from the time of grade school because he had a lisp. Um, he grew up without a father. His mother was more concerned about her boyfriends and drugs. He had a lot of anger, and he acted out on it. Um, I don't think that's mental illness. I just think that's hatred. But back to purgatory, um, all things will be exposed. And yeah, I think some people are just hoping to go through life with nobody finding out their secrets, which is kind of sad because you know you'll have to step into the light to get into heaven. There is only light in heaven. You can't keep your secrets. Oh, limbo is not the same thing as purgatory. But, but for instance, when I went to a church a week ago, the man who was preaching, they just told me that he had been taken to meet the poor guy in the church who was there. And he was so full of just so loving that day that he was just moved. Yes, so in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, what will we be judged on? We'll be judged by the Son of Man. So the Son of Man truly is Christ, but it doesn't say Christ, it doesn't say God, it says the Son of Man. We'll be judged on what the perfect human being looks like. Like I, It's going to be a long ways. Okay, so we've gone too long, so... Um, Next week, we don't have one. The next class I think I'm doing is called The Spirituality of Aging. So, um, there you go. So, God bless you. Thank you for the treats. Glad you could be here. <laughs>